Did you know? Undertale's concept of befriending monsters rather than killing them was largely inspired by the demon recruiting mechanic from the Shin Megami Tensei series. This mechanic allows players to negotiate with their enemies through a talk command and potentially recruit them as an ally. In an interview with fellow indie dev Sean Hogan, Undertale creator Toby Fox said, I wanted to make an RPG game where you could befriend all of the bosses, where not killing everything is actually a viable option. Most RPGs are endless murder fests. How many monsters do you kill? And to what end? Everything sort of naturally arose from that concept. Toby also wanted to make each monster feel like an individual, as monsters in most RPGs would simply attack the player over and over again with predictable reckless abandon. The defensive parts of the battle system were inspired by the defense mechanics from the Mario and Luigi RPG series, as well as bullet hell shooting games like Toho Project. Toby has also stated that Breath of Fire 3 is one of the RPGs that has influenced him the most, as well as Chrono Trigger. Creating the battle system was the first stage of development, and preceded the creation of the game's characters, story, and setting. Some of the content in Undertale did exist before the combat system, however. Sansa's battle theme, Megalovania, was originally created for a Halloween hack of Earthbound that Toby released in 2008. A second version of the song was also released as part of the webcomic Homestuck. Surprisingly, there's a chance that Megalovania might have never been made. When Toby was creating his Earthbound Halloween hack, he planned to use the track Megalomania from the Japan-exclusive RPG Live a Live as the final boss theme. Toby elaborated in his making of Earthbound Halloween document saying, I wanted to put Live a Live's Megalomania in here, but I didn't get to, so I made my own last boss song. I pretty much just yelled whatever I felt like into a mic and copied it down. Yep, took forever, but it was super kick-ass worth it. Total embodiment of final bossitude. The tracks Fallen Down and Another Medium also existed before Undertale, and the themes Heartache, Bone Trousel, and Papyrus's theme were all made for a different RPG by Toby that never came to fruition. The tracks Death by Glamour and Metal Crusher were also partly based on a previous track. Toby did the track as a fan-made theme for a character in the webcomic Cucumber Quest. Most of the music created for Undertale was constructed using free sound fonts and synths in the popular program FL Studio. This method of music making led to the creation of songs such as Thundersnail, which was made using a single sample with some slight editing. Thundersnail isn't the only track that has an interesting use of samples. The track Dog Song was made using the Mario Paint sound font, which Toby has used in the past for his work on Homestuck. The track that plays after Mediton bursts out of the wall titled It's Showtime is composed entirely of instruments found on the Yamaha YM2612 sound chip, which is the same sound chip used in the Sega Genesis. Both Sans and Papyrus are named after popular fonts. Sans is particularly known for this, with most of his text being in lowercase comic Sans. When Sans speaks seriously, however, he uses 8-bit Operator, which is another Sans Serif font. Both skeletons draw inspiration from the webcomic Helvetica, which stars a skeleton protagonist also named after a font. The creator of the Helvetica webcomic, J.N. Weedle, even appears in Undertale's credits as a special inspiration. Various aspects of the game's world were inspired by the Mother series, and this can be seen in Papyrus's design. The markings on Papyrus Papyrus's chestplate are identical to the marks on the chest of the Starman from Earthbound. Toriel was created as a parody of tutorial characters, with Toby Fox citing Fee from The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword as a notable influence. Fox said, I played Skyward Sword and despised how often Fee would give me the answer to a puzzle. I figured that if someone was that concerned about you, then they wouldn't tell you the answers. They would just do the puzzles and fight all the monsters for you. This is why she literally holds your hand through a segment of the game. Her motherly personality was chosen both as an extension of her hand holding and due to the lack of genuine motherly characteristics in other RPGs like Pokemon or Earthbound. Though uncommon, it's also possible to die in the fight against Toriel. Accomplishing this causes her to show a shocked expression on her face for a split second before going to the game over screen. Toriel also has an unused sprite that is nearly identical to her death sprite. The file is named SBR underscore Toriel Boss underscore Suicide. It is possible that Toriel was originally going to commit suicide in one of the game's scenarios. This isn't that out of place either, as Asgore can also commit suicide. If the player already killed Flowey in a previous playthrough of the game, Flowey won't kill Asgore after you show him mercy. Instead, Asgore forces the player to take his soul and urges them to find a way to free everyone. The short track that plays before the fight against Asgore is called Bergen Trukung. Bergen Trukung is a concept from European mythology and folklore, and is commonly known in English as the King in the Mountain. The trope usually involves a sleeping or dormant hero who will one day awaken to save the day. Asgore's place in the story of Undertale is a literal representation of the trope's name, as he's a king in the underground of Mount Ebat. Mount Ebat might also be a reference to Toby Fox himself, as it's very similar to his name when spoken backwards. In one of Fox's biggest inspirations, the Mother series, there's a place called Mount Itoi. This area is named after Mother creator Shigesato Itoi. 
Undine's name derives from the Undine, which are female spirits or nymphs inhabiting water. They can vary greatly in appearance and were first named in the writings of the 15th century Swiss occultist Paracelsus, which have become a part of German folklore. The Temi species in Undertale is named after artist Temi Chang, who worked on the game. According to Temi's blog, the appearance of the Temi race was based on a simple doodle done by artist Betty Kwong. They didn't know what Temi actually looked like, so they made a drawing based on Temi's personality traits. Temi then made the doodle into her mascot, and the Temi race represented her with an Undertale. Temi isn't the only developer to cameo in Undertale. The recurring annoying dog character is a representation of the game's creator, Toby Fox. Flowey the Flower has a very distinctive laugh. <laughs> What's interesting is this laugh is used by an enemy in the PlayStation game Tomba, known as Tombi in Europe, and the enemy is even a flower. Did you know? Undertale was funded through the crowdfunding site Kickstarter and ended up raising $51,124, over 10 times the campaign's original goal. The character Muffet is one of the three characters created by Kickstarter backers, the other two being the hidden bosses Glide and So Sorry. Muffet was originally designed by cartoonist Michelle Tchaikovsky, who runs the webcomic Ava's Demon. While Tchaikovsky created Muffet's design and the idea of having a tea party with the player, Undertale creator Toby Fox did most of the work on her personality and role. He also made her human-sized, which Tchaikovsky hadn't envisioned. Shortly after the release of Undertale, there was a controversy surrounding the hidden enemy So Sorry. This character was created by a user named Samil after they chose the $1,000 backer tier in the Undertale Kickstarter. Several players felt that So Sorry didn't fit the game, or that the character was an unwarranted cameo by the designer. This resulted in a backlash against Samil across various media outlets. The backlash eventually came to the attention of Toby Fox, who responded by asking people not to harass his supporters. The $1,000 tier in Undertale's Kickstarter was actually a joke tier that Toby expected to remain unpledged. Additionally, its seemingly ridiculous cost was also a reference to the Homestuck adventure game Kickstarter. For Homestuck, the pledge was $10,000 and read, Your fan troll will become canon and appear in Homestuck. The amalgamated monsters in Undertale are a concept that Toby has used before. Fox released a ROM hack of Earthbound called the Earthbound Halloween hack. Towards the end of the hack, an enemy called the Amalgamate blocks the player, and this foe is a fusion of enemies seen throughout the game. Napstablook's name is likely a reference to the file-sharing software Napster, which was frequently used to share music in the early 2000s. The computer in Napstablook's house also displays a, quote, music-sharing forum, another nod to Napster. The monster Lukes is a member of a species called Eyewalker, a reference to Star Wars and its main character, Luke Skywalker. According to Toby, there were originally plans for the player to marry a robot, presumably Metaton. This feature was cut from the final game for unknown reasons, but this wasn't the only cut feature linked to Metaton. It was originally planned for Metaton to save images of the player's essay to their hard drive, a feature that was removed from the final version of the game because it was simply too buggy. Metaton is also partially inspired by the Twitter user Nerdbot Mark II. One of the game's consumable items is a stake in the shape of Metaton's face. During normal encounters, the item's name is abbreviated as Face Stake in the inventory. If the player is named Drac, Gigi, or Gugu, however, it will be abbreviated as F Stake. This is a reference to the Persona 4 comic by Giggy Diggy, who also made Cucumber Quest. The abandoned quiche in the waterfall area seems to be a reference to a real-world event where Toby Fox found an abandoned quiche under a bench, as implied by a tweet he made in October 2015. In Undertale's Tim shop, there's a bottle on a shelf, which may be a reference to Undertale artist Timmy Chang's thesis film, titled Potion Shop. This wouldn't be the only object from Undertale that seems to be inspired by Timmy's thesis. The animation also features a fish-like house with scales and similar proportions to Undyne's house. Early concept art for both Undyne's house and Alphys' lab can be found within the game's unused assets. These crude versions of the in-game locations feature several differences when compared with their final counterpart. Parts. The concept art for Undyne's house has a fishbowl and much more clutter on the kitchen countertops, while art for Alphys' lab features a bed which would eventually become the easy-to-draw cube. The concept art for Undertale mostly shares this simplistic aesthetic, as can be seen in the concept art for the bartender Grillby and what may be Papyrus, as well as the character Burger Pants. Interestingly, the line art for Burger Pants' in-game sprite is almost exactly the same as the original concept art.
If the player somehow manages to not fulfill any of the requirements for any of the game's endings, they will get the impossible or dirty hacker ending. It's unclear exactly how a player would attain this ending without modifying the game's files in some way, or if it's even possible to do so. In the ending, Sans will suggest that the player contact the developer so they can fix the game or add another ending. He then implies that the player is probably just a dirty hacker. Many unused assets appear throughout the game's files, and most of them relate to things that were either removed or went unused. However, there are three files that exist solely to discourage data miners from posting what they might find. The first is a simple image with a black background and white text named abc underscore 1111 underscore 0 dot png. The message asks the reader not to post the game's sprite sheets online, as Fox would like the player to see each sprite in context first and not be spoiled. The second message is an audio file named abc underscore 123 underscore a dot aug. The audio file has several text to speech voices asking the listener to show some respect and not spoil the game for others. Respect and don't spoil the game. Despite the seemingly random nature of these first two file names, the names actually force the files to appear at the top of alphabetical lists. Effectively, this makes them the first files that most hackers and data miners will see. The third and final file is a text file, included along with other game-important text files. This file, again, requests that the reader not post it online. After an update in January 2016, the abc123a.og file was replaced with a different clip of random and jarring sounds. <laughs> Interestingly, these aren't the only audio secrets in the game. The track that plays while the player is being judged by Sans, titled The Choice, almost exactly matches up with the track titled Undertale when sped up by 666%. Undertale was met with praise upon release, as it let players complete the game without killing. After the release of Undertale, a concerned parent called into the CBN show The 700 Club asking for advice. The parent was worried that her daughter had multiple pictures of a cartoon skeleton wearing a hoodie on her phone, presumably Sans. Pat Robertson, the CEO of CBN, urged the concerned parent to give their daughter something more wholesome, and went on to say there's got to be some video game that isn't so evil. The irony was not lost on Undertale fans. Here's a real high-class bout. And begin! Did you know? Brothers and Cuphead creators Chad and Jared Moldenhauer always had the idea of making a game of their own, though they lacked the resources to do so for many years. After seeing the success of the indie scene in 2010, especially with games like Super Meat Boy and Castle Crashers, the two realized it was possible for them to make a quality game, and development on Cuphead entered its early stages soon after. From the start, the gameplay was inspired by running gun games like Contra and Gunstar Heroes, but the game's eventual look was rooted in 1930s cartoons, notably for from the works of Fleischer Studios. The brothers grew up watching cartoons from the era through VHS tapes they got themselves or as gifts. The duo figured that, as technology improved, someone would make a game in that style, but no one attempted it to the degree they hoped for. The idea of 1930s visuals actually began as a joke they'd shoot around in brainstorming sessions. Thinking they'd be unable to pull the look off successfully, they dabbled in other styles but always came back to that idea. Despite their lack of training, it was something that resonated with them, and they dove right into it. When thinking of designs for the game's protagonist, there had been hundreds of ideas drawn up, but nothing was working for them at first. They wanted to steer clear of animals due to how common they were in platformers, opting for something they could call their own. A lightbulb character fittingly led to the idea of more inanimate objects for heads, and led to them being more experimental with their designs. Near the end of the process, Chad would study background elements in cartoons for anything he could find, and over time they came to the design we now know. The designs also said to have roots in a 30s Japanese propaganda film that featured a man with a teacup head. Some of the scrapped ideas showed up in the final game as NPCs such as the Axe and Applehead designs, and Mugman's character came from the desire of a two-player dynamic. Being the younger brother, Jared said he always identified as Luigi, and they wanted to give off a Mario Brothers vibe with the duo. The game started out simple, and was planned to have eight bosses in a similar structure to the Mega Man series. However, with its popularity at trade shows, the two felt the need to expand the game to feature more content 
what they originally envisioned before scaling back. It resulted in the team and development time increasing, but they were still set on seeing it to the end. The game's animation process was said to slow down production by 80% when compared to doing it digitally. They stuck with it because they wanted to be as true to the art style as they could, and to help keep traditional animation alive. It was even considered to color everything by hand, but it only would have gone to add years to production time. The style lent itself to the gameplay due to the wild eccentric nature of 30s cartoons, leading to near endless possibilities for boss ideas. That said, before coming up with a boss, they needed to know how it'd play out in advance. Depending on its size or location, they designed it with that in mind, coupled with the theme of where they'd appear in the game. There was one idea where a boss would be fought on a sheet of music with the patterns relying on the level's actual soundtrack. This idea didn't get off the ground as the pattern couldn't be changed once implemented, plus the track had to be different for each of the game's difficulty settings. Despite the pushbacks in the four years since its first announcement, the game proved popular through it all, selling over one million copies in its first two weeks. The studio took many chances throughout development, but took things in small steps before getting to the game's current scope. Jared has said that had they known just how much work would go into Cuphead from the start, they likely never would have made it. Cuphead's development was an intimate affair. Spouses, cousins, and friends of the brothers lent their talents to help bring it to life, being as passionate as they were about the project and gaming as well. The game's composer, Chris Madigan, was a friend of the brothers since childhood and was their go-to guy, knowing he could deliver on the soundtrack they needed. That said, the game was also a first for Madigan. Though he had studied jazz, he didn't consider it his strong suit, on top of doing little actual composing beforehand. Game tracks often loop at a point in their songs, but for Cuphead, Madigan wanted each piece to be as long as it needed to be, even if the player wouldn't hear the full piece in game. Though there were limitations to how the music could interact with the action on screen, a staple of classic cartoons, Madigan instead went for the vibe of excitement and unpredictability, complementing the game's nature. Each piece also has several different mixes and solos. When one was recorded, they'd have soloists play over the finished piece, with a variety of instruments and improvised segments. Because of this, when fighting the same boss again, a slight variation on their theme can be heard. There are a few nods to other video games in Cuphead's score. The Funfair Fever track has a similar segment to the athletic theme from Super Mario World. This bit, according to Madigan, was a crazy coincidence. If I did it on purpose, I would totally own it. But it's actually a fairly standard ragtime cliche in some ways. When Koji Kondo used it, it was already old. For a game that's full of homages, that was a total accident. The Mario series helped influence another track more directly. The Elder Kettle's theme was initially made for a possible water world that was cut from the final product. Madigan looked to Koji Kondo's method of scoring for water levels in the Mario Brothers soundtrack 33 and a third book, noting that many are based on waltz numbers. Coincidentally, a master class he attended was covering how to write waltzes, and he saw it fitting to make one. There are dozens of references to games and animation sprinkled throughout Cuphead, with the team wanting them to act more as subtle nods than direct shoutouts. Goopy Legrand's look was inspired by early RPGs where enemies were commonly slime creatures, and was in Cuphead before their own boss formula. The third phase of Dramatic Fanatic is another nod to JRPGs, with Sally stage plays cut out bearing a striking resemblance to Kefka from Final Fantasy VI. Grim Matchstick has roots in Mega Man 2's Mecha Dragon Boss, and his name references animator Grim Natwick who worked on many Fleischer cartoons and, like Matchstick, spoke with a pronounced stutter. Dr. Call shares his surname with one of Disney's nine old men, Milk Call, and the level Perilous Pier shows a building named Hotel Iwerks, referencing animator and co-creator of Mickey Mouse, Ub Iwerks. Baroness Von Bonbon has design roots in not only cartoons, but also in actresses from the era, such as Betty Grable, B.B. Daniels, and Loretta Young. The Railroad Wrath bosses all have ties to Japanese yokai. The Ghost with Tenome, a ghost with eyes on their hands, the Skeleton with Gashadokuro, a giant skeleton, the train pistons possibly with long neck yokai such as Rokuro Kubi, and the head of the train with Oboruguruma, ox carts with faces that appear in the dead of night. The stage also draws parallels with Final Fantasy VI's Phantom Train, as both have the player make their way through a haunted train before fighting the train itself. The level Clip Joint Calamity is one huge shout out to the Street Fighter series. Ribby and Croak start the fight with Ryu and Ken's taunts, and their moves reference other fighters. From E Honda's 100 
100 Hand Slap, Guile's Sonic Boom, Dalsim's Yoga Fire, and even Blanca's Roll. Their slot machine phase references the Street Fighter 2 bosses, with US Balrog depicted by the machine itself and Vega, Sagat, and M. Bison by the slot patterns, as it shows snakes, tigers, and bulls respectively. Lastly, when the player dies to the devil in his second phase, his death quote will be, Anyone who opposes me will be destroyed, which is directly lifted from M. Bison's Game Over quote in Street Fighter 2. Did you know? When localizing Shovel Knight for Japan, Yacht Club Games wanted to recreate some of the differences between Eastern and Western versions of games during the NES era. This included small changes like adding Japanese text to the title screen, making some of the game's coins resemble yen, changing character avatars to be more anime-like, and giving Shovel Knight a snooze bubble when he sleeps. Since the Famicom's disc system add-on had superior tech over the NES, the team wanted the Japanese version to reflect this. Yacht Club Games had to improve and add several animations to illustrate this. This included more frames for the dragon whelps, animating the grass and the plains, and adding animated water for the village fountain. The team also included a few extra secrets in the Japanese version. When the player visits Gastronomer to upgrade their health, he'll randomly sometimes serve up some onigiri. The game's cheats also have different effects such as carrots being replaced by daikon radishes, and gold coins rotating to better resemble a koban style coin. This level of dedication is typical of Yacht Club games and can be seen throughout the team's history. The company was founded by a group of ex Forward employees who wanted to keep making games together in a close-knit group. Typically, when a project at WayForward ended, teams split up and spread to other teams to lend additional support. However, some of the developers wanted to keep working with colleagues they built a relationship with, leading them to break away from WayForward and found their own studio. The initial idea for Shuffle Knight was conceived in January of 2013, in what artist Nick Wozniak described as a joke conversation over lunch that kind of got too serious. The six man team were set on making a title in the style of an NES game, and one that would be themed around a central mechanic. They thought about game mechanics they liked, and one that came up was the downward thrust found in Zelda 2, as it covered a lot of ground by being both a jumping and attacking maneuver. A few ideas came from this concept, including the player hitting enemies from above, flipping enemies over to expose weak points, and digging through blocks. These ideas didn't really fit the motif of a sword, so one team member suggested they have a knight character who carried a shovel, and the name Shovel Knight came not long after that. Two months later, the team took their game to Kickstarter with the campaign launching March 14th. On March 19th, it was announced the game would come to the Nintendo 3DS and Wii U. This was due to the efforts of Dan Adelman, former head of Nintendo of America's indie program. During Nintendo's early days of digital game distribution, there were no plans in place to release all new titles, much less from indie developers. However, Adelman saw the potential in giving indie devs a space on Nintendo platforms and spearheaded the WiiWare and DSiWare service. Nintendo were more willing to play ball with indie developers when the Wii U struggled with third-party support. Adelman previously worked with Yacht Club's Sean Velasco during his days at WayForward, and when the team got in touch with him before the Kickstarter went live, he had complete trust in them, and they were quickly approved. Yacht Club has said if not for Dan, Shovel Knight would have never made it to a Nintendo system, and it's possible the game would have never been funded in the first place. Upon the game's launch, Yacht Club divided their workload between Kickstarter and making a playable demo for the game. Yacht Club would attend PAX East on March 22nd, and Velasco recalled how nervous the team was about not having anything to show at the event, saying, I remember thinking even a week before PAX, well, maybe we won't be able to get a demo done, and we'll just have our banner there, and some beanbags, and Super Mario 64, and we'll just play it and tell people about the game even though there's no game to play. Fortunately, we were able to get it all done. The demo was received with positivity and was showcased case by popular gaming channels such as The Game Grumps and Super Best Friends Play. Shovel Knight had a crowdfunding goal of $75,000, which it easily reached by March 30th. Even when the campaign concluded on April 14th, it managed to raise over $300,000 from nearly 15,000 backers. One aspect of the game that the team were worried about was the difficulty scale. Members of Yacht Club worked on Blood Rain Betrayal at Way Forward and recalled how many people hated the game for its brutally frustrating difficulty. They did not want a repeat 
situation on their hands. So one feature they tinkered with was a checkpoint system. It started out similar to the ones found in the Mega Man games, being invisible with no clear indication. The team later decided they wanted something physical, and tested having clear checkpoints throughout the level. They still found the game to be too easy with checkpoints in place, so they thought about charging the players for using one. As the game centered around money, paying for a checkpoint added more value to it, and gave players the choice of when and where to save. However, they realized if a more inexperienced player wasn't able to collect enough money to pay for one, their frustration would only be exacerbated. So they turned this completely on its head and had players earn gold for deactivating a checkpoint. Elements of a story were fairly light at the time, with the idea being that Shovel Knight had a shovel and, at the end of the game, would bury his wife. Still, the idea of making something heartwarming with somber moments had been in their thoughts from the start. The bonfire segments between stages were a key visual conceived even before the gameplay was finalized, and is where Shield Knight eventually came into being. She initially started out as something for the player to go after, even being referred to as Princess MacGuffin by the team. An early sprite of her still exists in the game's data, simply labeled Princess. However, they decided to incorporate the bonfire imagery with Shovel Knight's attempts at saving somebody. Velasco imagined Shovel Knight reliving a nightmare over and over, failing to save Shield Knight. Making these segments playable also helped the player become more invested in Shovel Knight's dilemma. While Shovel Knight was made to emulate the look of an NES game, it didn't shy away from the advances made with modern consoles. The team didn't dedicate themselves to replicating the NES capabilities perfectly, and broke limitations they felt would interfere with the gameplay. Sprite flickering, which occurred when the NES displayed more than 8 sprite tiles per horizontal line, was omitted. The team kept the sprite count as low as possible, but did not stress over it, especially when it came to making things a bit more flashy. When it came to animations, at times they would remove frames, and in other places they would leave it as is. One example noted by Velasco was with Spectre Knight, who had elaborate movements they found to look completely natural. Shovel Knight also has multiple layers of background parallax scrolling, a feature that lets a game slide background elements at different speeds, often used to create an illusion of depth. While the technique was common on the Super Nintendo, it was rare on the NES. It could only be done with careful planning. As an added bonus, this direction allowed them to take advantage of the stereoscopic 3D effects of the Nintendo 3DS hardware. Sticking to the NES's strict palette of 54 colors presented some challenges as well. A few extra colors were added to the mix, including different skin tones to diversify the in-game cast, as well as the various backers who had their likeness featured in the Hall of Champions. For Polar Knight, a shade of beige was added to his skin and cloak. This color isn't used for anything else in the game, and was originally a placeholder, but it was left alone when the team couldn't find something better. The team also discarded the limitation that forced sprites to share color palettes. On the NES, if a sprite changed color, all other sprites used and the same colors would change accordingly as they're sharing the same palette information. Yacht Club did, however, use limited palettes for enemy damage and explosion effects. The NES was also unable to display large sprites. Large enemies and bosses on the NES often didn't move, as they were mostly made up of background tiles. This was done to get around the system's harsh sprite limitations, but came at the cost of making bosses almost entirely stationary. While the team liked the impact NES bosses had as a result of this, they opted to just make larger sprites and have fewer restrictions. Expansions for the game were planned during the crowdfunding period. At the time, the stretch goals were simply labeled as Playable Boss Night 1, 2, and 3. These expansions originally had players go through the same game as one of the order of no quarter, with some minor changes to the gameplay and story. Work began for Plague of Shadows before the base game released, and the team compared it to Richter Mode in Castlevania Symphony of the Night. However, the team thought it would be weird for Plague Knight to be traversing in the world with all the dialogue being the exact same as the original game. They also felt it would be disappointing if the two knights played identically, and began adding more features and alternative routes as well as a new narrative. Though the scope expanded, all the expansions remained totally free. Yacht Club found this helped to advertise the game, inspiring fans to buy the game again on other platforms or buy it for their friends. The game also featured a renowned butt mode, where most nouns in the game's text are replaced with the word but this was the final goal for Shovel Knight's Kickstarter, coming about on the final day. As the game had hit every stretch goal possible, the team was concerned about adding any more, fearing they'd never get the game done if they did. Someone suggested butt mode to be the next goal, and when asked what that was, the person kept it a secret. Somewhat like Shovel Knight itself, it started out as something that was supposed to be a joke that got a little too serious, with Velasco saying, we didn't even know what it was going to be in the beginning, but we thought no matter what it was, we had to put it in butt mode. Then one day, Dan D'Angelo, our programmer, 
said, but mode is in. Truly inspiring. Another interesting secret can be found in the game's second campaign, Shovel Knight Plague of Shadows. If the player is unwilling to fight Plague of Shadows and simply stand still during the fight, the encounter will end after about 40 seconds without the player taking a hit. The boss seems to give up and the player continues to the next area. Did you know? A Hat in Time originally began as a one-man project by Danish indie developer Jonas Karlev, who initially wanted to make something to put on his resume. Over time, the game's team Gears for Breakfast grew to eight people from Denmark, the United States, the UK, and Australia. Early development was done entirely by volunteers with no actual budget going into it. The project led to a crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter with the initial goal of $30,000. The campaign raised more than $60,000 in the first two days and ultimately raised $296,300. $260. During this time, the bulk of the team never actually met face to face, with each member working on their own and submitting the work to the rest of the team online. Because of their smaller size, many members of the team were forced to take multiple roles. Art director William T. Nichols also worked as a level designer, and Karlev had a hand in programming, animation, scripting, and marketing. Early in its life, A Hat in Time was a fairly different kind of game. The project's original direction was a 3D hack and slash adventure game with platforming elements. However, Karlev realized the game's platforming elements were more appealing than its combat, and the title was retooled as a platformer. The team was motivated by a notable absence of three-dimensional collectathon platforming games in recent years. In an interview with Polygon, Karlev partially attributed the lack of platformers to one game in particular, saying, I don't want to blame it all on Donkey Kong 64, but it's partially at fault. Donkey Kong 64 did a lot of things wrong in that it's very tedious to collect everything in order to move on. A lot of people don't want that. They want to breathe through the game if they so desire, but there are also people who want to collect everything and get stronger and better. While Donkey Kong 64 leaned too much on collectibles, the team felt that Banjo-Kazooie struck the right balance, and they aimed to do the same. Other titles that inspired A Hat in Time were Super Mario 64, Super Mario Sunshine, and Psychonauts. The game also had some real-world inspirations. The first area of the game, Mafia Town, was inspired by the Greek island Santorini, which can be seen in its white buildings and blue rooftops. Due to the decline of 3D platforming, the team were worried that A Hat in Time wouldn't be well received by the gaming community. Prior to the launch of their Kickstarter, Karlev even considered dropping the game's fundraising goal from $30,000 to $20,000. This amount wouldn't be enough to fund development, but the project had been entirely volunteer based up to that point and simply needed any kind of budget to continue. While drawing heavily from games in the past, the team also made tweaks to ensure A Hat in Time would appeal to modern gamers. Karlev acknowledged that games of the past could rely on simple goals and objectives, but players today desire interesting stories and characters. The team also worked hard to ensure that A Hat in Time was large without feeling empty or shallow. One aspect of the game that proved to be particularly challenging was the inclusion of co-op mode, which was originally one of the game's stretch goals on Kickstarter. In order to keep this mode fun for everyone playing, the developers made it impossible for players to bump into or kill each other in co-op. Another part of the game that changed during development was the function of the game's badges. Early on, the game's badges were a primary source of new abilities for Hat Kid. However, the abilities were ultimately transferred to hats, while badges were used for upgrades and secondary abilities. Early footage of A Hat in Time gained attention from fans for its colorful aesthetic and cel-shaded graphics, drawing many favorable comparisons to The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. However, the game's visual style evolved greatly over the course of its development. When Carlab first began the project by tinkering with the Unreal Engine development kit, the game had a more washed-out color palette that was heavy on grays. This was not by design, but rather because of a default setting in the Unreal Engine that automatically dulled by 10%. Cell Shaded graphics were a deliberate design choice, though, for reasons more economical than aesthetic. Karlev explained, The cell shaded style is kind of easy to make something pretty without having to put a lot of effort into it. That sounds cheap, but it's kind of the truth. We want to make something look good, but that allows us as a small team to make it fast without wasting millions of dollars into just a single strand of hair. The use of cell shaded graphics allowed the team to hide seams in the characters' models and use less detailed textures. The first song composed for the game's soundtrack was the Moon Jumpers theme. Since the game's composer, Pascal Michael Stifel, didn't know where the song would ultimately end up in the game, he wrote a song to reflect a Hat in Time's feel as a whole. Since it wasn't yet tied to any specific area of the game, the Moon Jumpers theme was the first heard on the title screen of the game's playable alpha build. The game also contains several secrets. The game's projectile badge appears to be a reference to Super Mario RPG. If the player equips the badge and attacks, Hat Kid fires a beam that shoots out a thin line and then expands. Three Stars also appears 
the beams being charged. This is extremely similar to Gino's star beam attack. There's also a series of easter eggs hidden throughout the entire game. There are dozens of hamburgers hidden all around a hat in time's world in obscure places, most of which are yet to be discovered. Another interesting fact is that the game's interiors aren't actually there. The depth behind the windows in Mafia Town comes from box projected cube maps that are essentially an illusion of space. This technique is also used in Dead Bird Basement in Alpine Skyline. Another illusion takes place in Hat Kid's spaceship. The ship's geometry doesn't make sense in a 3D space, as many rooms overlap with one another. The game hides chunks of geometry depending on which room the player is in to make it all seem plausible. In the spaceship bedroom, there's a secret pillow fort containing Hat Kid's diary. Players can only read the diary entry for the previous mission, and the diary becomes accessible after the player unlocks Subcon Forest. However, there are unaccessible diary entries for earlier missions. Earlier builds of the game include content that was hidden, unfinished, or changed in later versions. The beta version includes five unused cutscenes, four from Mafia Town, and one specifically tied to Mafia HQ. The Mafia HQ scene is also labeled Rhythm Segment, suggesting that there could have been a rhythm game inspired portion of the level at some point. In the alpha version of the game, there's an island that can't be reached by normal means. On the island is a tent containing a chalkboard with a warning message that reads, you should not be here, leave or I will send Queen Vanessa after you. These players always trying to break my level design grumble. This island also exists in the beta version and contains a more lighthearted message signed WTN, most likely short for William T. Nichols, the game's art director. On the other side of the island is a tombstone with an engraved message featuring an easily decipherable alphabet. When decoded, the message reads, Here lies my dad who loved me with all of his heart and knew that I could always be a success in all that I did. Did you know the nails carried by Hal Ness Bugs were possibly made by the nailsmith? Outside his hut you can see countless nails he forged, then discarded for not meeting his standards, which were eventually seized by sentries, husks, and moss knights. According to Hall Knight's creators, Ari Gibson and William Pellin, within his forge the nailsmith is searching, on an endless quest to create a flawless nail. Past failures pile outside his door, exposed to the rains and left to rust. He spares no thought for imperfect things, nor does he pause to take notice of the countless beings that take their pick of his refuse, but his neglect has impact. His discarded nails have spread wide throughout Hallownest, clutched tight in the hands of creatures possessed. Hall Knight's creation was funded by a Kickstarter campaign in 2014, and this sliver of lore was revealed for the first time, alongside the Nailsmith's final design in backer update number 5. It was not, however, mentioned in the game itself, so it's unclear if it should still be considered canon, or lore that got scrapped in development. Another piece of lost lore centers around a character named Professor Milana Luzo. In update number 3, Great Hoppers and Aspid Hunters were revealed to the game's backers, except they were originally purple, and called Greater Susking Hop Pod and bulbous humming nits. The Kickstarter said these names were an excerpt from the Field Guide to the Ruined Kingdom Hallow Nest by Milana Luzzo, professor of bestiology. In the replies, a backer commented that the names sounded like creatures from the Pikmin series, to which Team Cherry replied, William, our coder, absolutely adores Pikmin. Professor Milana Luzzo seems to share similar tastes. We were curious not only about the name change, but also because Hollow Knight doesn't actually contain a character named Milana Luzzo, so we reached out to Hollow Knight's technical director and programmer Dave Kazi, who told us that Milana was originally planned as a professor who named all the bugs in Hallow Nest and records them in a creature compendium, sort of like the Piclopedia, but later in development the professor was scrapped and replaced with the hunter and his hunter's journal, who seems to take a more hands-on approach when it comes to dissecting Hallow Nest's bugs. Another character altered in development was the knight itself, who in the final game is a genderless protagonist who is neither male or female, but it appears Team Cherry originally envisioned the knight as a male. The character was first created as the Hungry Knight in Team Cherry's 2013 minigame by the same name. Then, a little while later, Ari made this concept art for what they'd start calling the Hungry Bug. When Team Cherry shared the concept art in their Kickstarter campaign, they said, These images are a glimpse of him as he journeys across the world, searching for something to fill his bottomless stomach. These concepts show a much creepier world than the one in Hollow Knight, and quite a different interpretation of the character. However, you can see in these pictures the beginning of the Hollow Knight concept and the world of Hallownest. Six months after the Kickstarter closed, they were calling him the Hollow Knight, and still referring 
referring to him constantly with male pronouns. But over the next couple years, the name Hollow Knight was repurposed for one of the game's biggest bosses, and the protagonist was rebranded as The Knight, a genderless vessel who's lost their memory. While talking to Dave Kazi, we took the opportunity to ask him about the New Game Plus mode mentioned in the Kickstarter. He told us they were considering different versions of bosses from the main campaign, more extreme difficulty, and the knight starting off with certain items acquired in previous playthroughs. They tinkered with New Game Plus for quite some time, and even thought about implementing it post-release, but ultimately weren't satisfied with what they'd come up with and abandoned the idea. Dave told us, I'm not sure if anything ever resonated. In the end, Steel Soul Mode, the Coliseum, multiple endings, and the Dream Nail provided much of the extra replay material, as well as a raft of secrets and easter eggs. They also experimented with ultra widescreen support, but it turned into more trouble than it was worth. Only a small percentage of PC players would have made use of a 21 by 9 ratio anyway, so they locked Hollow Knight to the traditional 16 by 9 format. Another scrapped idea was an ultra detailed map, with Ari saying, Originally, it was super explicit and detailed, useful to navigate, but using it was visually exhausting for the player. Hollow Knight's Kickstarter campaign raked in almost double its initial goal of 35,000 Australian dollars. The third stretch goal was developing a Wii U edition, which was unlocked at $50,000. Keep in mind this was 2014, a time when Nintendo fans were desperate for quality games on their console of choice. Judging from the enthusiasm in the comments section, it appears Wii U owners deserved much of the credit for pushing the Kickstarter past its first two goals, unlocking the White Palace and four extra quests. In fact, if it wasn't for Wii U loyalists, the Coliseum of Fools and the upcoming sequel Silk Song never would have been funded. A second quest starring Hornet was originally promised as a main game DLC and just barely reached its goal of 56 grand, with only one hour left in the Kickstarter's 30 day campaign. As Team Cherry fleshed out the second quest development over the next few years, it got bigger and bigger, until they eventually realized it would grown so large that it should really be a full fledged sequel. The next stretch goal was the Coliseum of Fools, which actually failed to secure funding, but Team Cherry was determined to raise the last $2100, so they solicited PayPal donations from so-called slacker backers, until finally, nine months later, the Coliseum of Fools got its final dollar. Hollow Knight's future on Wii U was looking bright. Team Cherry announced they were dreaming up cool ways to use the gamepad, integrate Miiverse, and a Hollow Knight amiibo. They even said they hoped the Knight would make its way into Super Smash Bros, although they were half joking on that last one. Hollow Knight was initially scheduled to launch in June 2015, but during development their ambitions grew, to the point where Hollow Knight ended up several times larger than their original vision. Many supporters grew frustrated as delays pushed launch all the way back into 2017, at which point the Wii U was already a dead console, and the Nintendo Switch was right around the corner. In the end, Hollow Knight never came to the Wii U at all, and Team Cherry did their best to make it right by offering those backers free upgrades to the Switch port. We were curious about those cancelled gamepad features though, so we asked Dave Causey what the Wii U edition would have looked like if it was ever completed. He said they planned on having the map, charms, and loadout screens displayed on the gamepad, and also wanted to implement some exclusive features that enhanced gameplay. An example he gave was how shaking the flashlight works in The Last of Us Part 2. Their primary focus, however, was getting the game running smoothly, and they never actually drew up a definitive list of gamepad features before the Wii U edition got scrapped. Whatever features they would have added, though, may have been cool, but not groundbreaking, since Team Cherry didn't want to put players on other platforms at a serious disadvantage. But even though the Wii U edition died prematurely, Dave Causey told us the considerable amount of time they spent working on it forced him to use the more powerful Unity engine and heavily optimized the entire game, which benefited not only the eventual Switch port, but Hollow Knight on all platforms. In other words, between the engine optimization and Kickstarter stretch goals, Hollow Knight owes much of its success and possibly its very existence to Wii U fans. Unfortunately, despite Team Cherry's push for slacker backers, the Kickstarter still ended up a few thousand dollars short of unlocking Zote as a playable character. William and Ari later discussed some of their unused ideas for a Zote campaign in one of their Mixer developer streams, which, along with all their other streams, were deleted forever when Mixer tragically shut down in 2020. They said, We did discuss what it might be. We never solidified an idea. The simplest idea was that it was just a mode in the game where you were really crap. Yeah, like play through again, but you're kind of zotified. Stuff like, after you dash, you have a chance to trip up, your nail is really weak. It'd be funny to have people react to you differently as well. When you take a hit, you kind of like, go for 
flying like Zote does in the Colosseum, ricocheting around. Zote's second class skills would have amounted to a challenge mode for experienced players, but since Hornet's Quest ended up becoming a full-fledged sequel, fans eventually started wondering if Zote might star in a potential third game. When Team Cherry hosted an Ask Me Anything on Reddit in 2018, one of those fans asked if it was possible, even though Zote's stretch goal failed to achieve funding. William replied, uh, maybe. We do have an idea for a third character story that we think would be a lot of fun to make. It might be a little way off though. Interestingly, his wording implies that third character might be someone other than Zote, but unfortunately, Team Cherry declined our request for clarification, so I guess we'll just have to wait and see. The Kickstarter's next unfunded stretch goal was a PlayStation Vita edition, which Dave told us they never even made plans for, but if it had been funded, it probably would have been delayed until after the Switch release, and would have had to be trimmed and lean to run on Vita from a better baseline. The final unmet goal was a section of Halloness called The Abyss, that would have included four additional bosses. The final game did end up with an area called the Abyss, but according to Ari, that's just the Abyss Shore, and the unfunded expansion would have taken players down into the Lake of Void to explore the twisted space within. After the Abyss, the Kickstarter teased fans that more stretch goals would be revealed if they raised enough money. We asked Dave if they actually had any specific ideas for content in reserve, or if they were just gonna wing it as more money came in. He said, more of the latter, smiley face. It's funny how different the climate is today compared to when the Hollow Knight Kickstarter was run. If somehow it had seen a runaway funding success like Crowsworn had just recently, I have no idea how that would have played out for Hollow Knight and making new goals. Another cut location revealed in the Kickstarter was the ant-infested Forest of Bones, the largest area in the game, which according to this prototype map made up about 20% of Hollow Knight's total square footage. In their AMA, William said, you earn the monarch wings there by fighting a huge bony creature that would chase you across several screens, and the lava was going to kill you instantly if you touched it. It easily would have been the best area of the game, with 50 unique enemies, incredible spine-chilling music, bizarre surprises around every corner, etc, etc. Imagine your favorite area of Hollow Knight, but 100 times better. You can see the chase scene depicted on the proto map, with the knight entering from Deep Nest, exploring down and to the left until it encounters the bony creature and gets chased right, until falling into the room containing the monarch wings. The Forest of Bones also would have included an encounter with Hornet, the Dusk Knight, and the White Knight Dryah, who was originally planned as a nail on nail boss battle at the entrance to the Queen's Glade. Deep within the forest, you'd find the Holy Grounds, a place of worship overrun with enemies, and beneath that was the Abyss Shore. But on Unlike the full abyss, the Forest of Bones wasn't cut for a lack of funding, but to speed up development and keep Hollow Knight from getting too big. Dave Kazi told us, The Forest of Bones was intended to be part of the main game initially, but was eventually cut as part of a tidy up of the scope to keep things on track. There were levels built with scenery and doors and basic interactable environment items, but was not fleshed out in much more detail, as I recall. The area looked and felt good, but the scope of the game was getting quite large, so it was, reluctantly, removed from Hollow Knight. Fortunately though, it appears lots of the Forest of Bones assets eventually found a new home in the upcoming sequel. William and Ari mentioned another scrap boss idea in one of their now deleted Mixer streams, explaining that a hidden boss was originally planned for the first room where you encounter Aspids in the Forgotten Crossroads. One regular Aspid would appear, and if you killed it, another would fly out to take its place. After you killed the second Aspid, another would show up, continuing until you killed 10 in a row. Then a giant primal Aspid would fly in for a boss fight. Like many of their unused ideas, Team Cherry publicly considered adding it with a post-release update, but never ended up getting around to it. Throughout Hollow Knight's four-year development, content was getting cut up until the very last minute. Under the trailer for the final Godmaster DLC, the video description said one of the new features was Charm Glorification, a mechanic that rewarded you for completing God Home's challenges by upgrading the charms you'd already acquired in the core game. But when the DLC dropped seven months later, Charm Glorification was nowhere to be found. Leading a viewer on Mixer to ask Team Cherry why it got cut. Godmaster's release was already way behind schedule, and according to William, getting rid of glorification saved them from having to delay it even further. Its inclusion also would have pushed players into the God Home quest, and Team Cherry didn't want players to feel like they had to complete what amounted to a boss rush mode. In that same stream, Ari and William also explained they originally planned to implement a super difficult platforming challenge into God Home, similar to the White Palace Path of Pain. It made sense to add one last platforming section for returning 
returning players, but it was thematically disconnected from the rest of Godmaster. And since they were already running short on time, along with charm glorification, it ended up as Hollow Knight's last slice of cut content. Hello and welcome to Did You Know Gaming Extra. Today we're taking a look at a varied selection of indie games. Whether we're aware of it or not, most of us play indie games all the time. Minecraft, Among Us, Stardew Valley, Undertale, they're all indie games. And with their humble beginnings, we think all of them deserve a bit more love and attention, such as a dedicated video by a large YouTube trivia channel, for example. So let's jump in. One of the earliest indie hits of this millennium was Cave Story. Created by just a single developer known as Pixel, the game spawned several ports and remakes following the success of the original free-to-play PC version. These included versions for the Nintendo WiiWare service and the 3DS, both of which were significant overhauls and recreations of the original game. These versions had some minor adjustments to the game's dialogue, though not for any contentious reason, and more as a joke. In the game's original version, the character of Balrog makes his debut by busting through a wall, exclaiming, Huzzah! But with the game's WiiWare and 3DS editions, the line spoken is changed to, Oh yeah! This change was made because Balrog's wall-breaking entrance is reminiscent of the Kool-Aid Man, who has the iconic catchphrase, Oh yeah! Another indie game that's been around for quite some time is Terraria. The game came out of nowhere, effectively downsizing the already immensely successful Minecraft into a 2D perspective, and with it, creating its own massively popular sandbox survival adventure that saw ports to almost every major home format. PC, 3DS, PlayStation 3, 4, Vita, Wii U, Switch, Xbox 360, Xbox One, and mobile. Impressive for a game that, during its beta phase, used edited sprites from the early Final Fantasy games until being redone to distance itself. The beta also had a gun that was exclusively added to assist developers during the game's testing phase, the Zappinator. The gun was extremely overpowered during the game's earlier stages, prior to hard mode, letting the devs simply eliminate enemies so they wouldn't get in the way. While the weapon was found in the desktop version's data, it could not be found in-game. However, it was eventually added to the 3DS edition. This was most likely due to the game now being on a Nintendo console and the gun clearly being modeled after the NES Zapper peripheral. With this said, the gun did not appear in the now unsupported Wii U version, nor does it appear in the still updated version on the Nintendo Switch, though perhaps it will show up one day. Another game that's already gotten some love on this channel is the much-loved Undertale. Although some hate the game's fanbase, it's generally agreed that the game has great characters and a compelling narrative. With such a story-driven game, spoilers being spread online was a real concern the game's early days, with the game's creator Toby Fox seemingly doing all he could to prevent people from being spoiled. To try and curb spoilers surrounding the game's events, a note was left within the game's data for those that would reverse engineer it to find certain graphical assets. Since these graphics can potentially be a huge spoiler for later parts of the game, Toby Fox included a note titled ABC11110, a name chosen to make sure it appeared as the first file alphabetically if the game's graphics were extracted. The note says, Please don't upload these huge sprite sheets online. Just because most weird things here are used, I'd rather them be seen in context first. Wait like a year first. If you're just ripping normally scene sprites for sprite as resource or something, I don't care if you use these to make it easier though. This note was directed towards users of the Sprite as Resource, which hosts sprite sheets for several games, encouraging users to remove any spoiler-heavy sprites from the sheets prior to uploading it within the game's first year. The note was replaced in update version 1.001 to a new note which reads, You know what I hate? That's beepis. The taste. The smell. The texture. Hey, you're drooling. This note is in reference to an NPC in Earthbound, found in Moonside, who claims to hate whatever food the player chose as their favourite during the game's opening. As the note had little meaning, a Reddit user contacted Fox to confirm that it meant he was happy for people to view the game's sprites, to which he responded, Everyone's seen all the sprites at this point, I don't really care now. But indie games aren't simply a modern trend. Some have been around for decades. Revolution Software is a name many gamers of a certain generation would know, having created the much-beloved adventure series Broken Sword. These games saw commercial success, but by 2005, the company's model for commercial game development had become unsustainable, and they had to close the studio. 
but fate had a surprise in store for the team, with Apple contacting them directly a few years later, suggesting they release their game on the iOS platform. The game was a hit on the platform, and the company built themselves back up. Apple even included Broken Sword in a promotion during 2011. This gave them a new audience of 2.5 million people, many of whom would be the new generation of gamers, allowing them to continue creating games to this day. Another successful indie series is the SteamWorld franchise. While the games began with SteamWorld Tower Defense, the series didn't hit a wider audience until the release of SteamWorld Dig helped in part by Nintendo of Europe contacting developers Image and Form to include the game in a European Nintendo Direct. Work on the game was completed on June 28, 2013, with a planned release date of August 8. However, the team decided they'd release the game a day early in order to coincide the launch with the Nintendo Direct, which helped increase sales of the game thanks to the Direct's exposure. There had originally been plans for an additional area to be included in the game, though this was dropped because of time constraints. A similar story also occurred with the title's sequel, SteamWorld Dig 2. It was originally intended to feature a sunken city, as well as a set of icy caves that had been formed from giant cooling devices that regulated the temperature of Vectron, a location that was also supposed to have a second area, though this was also dropped, with the team choosing to make extra challenge levels for those who completed the game. These challenges were originally known as the Hell Caves, but this was changed to the Cave of Trials. SteamWorld Dig 2 also managed a pretty tremendous feat in 2017, when late into the year, Nintendo polled several Japanese players regarding which Switch games they recommend to their friends most. Because of the timing of this poll, the results were rather predictable, Breath of the Wild taking top spot, followed by Mario Odyssey, but the third being SteamWorld Dig 2, impressive considering the scale between the three titles. Now for one of our personal favourite indie games, Crawl, which was made by the two-person Australian developer Powerhoof. The title delighted gamers with its interesting blend of a cooperative and competitive multiplayer. In the roguelike brawler, players navigate randomly generated dungeons towards a boss battle, but with the twist of having their friends inhabit the bodies of monsters and demons blocking their path. One of these monsters in particular stands out from the crowd, and the story behind it is interesting to boot. It seems that from the beginning of their time developing the title, Powerhoof was set on the idea of including none other than Valve co-founder Gabe Newell as a playable boss in the game, having designed his sprite before the game was even released. Less than a year after the successful Early Access campaign, artist, designer, and former hat owner of Powerhoof, Barney Cumming, decided to reach out for permission to use Gabe's likeness. The email was as follows. Hello Gabe, my name is Barney Cumming, and I have a little indie game called Crawl which is currently on Early Access. I am writing to ask permission to use your likeness in my video game. I recently realized my silly fantasy of animating you as a powerful god in the game. You can view a gif here. The email then makes a plea to Gabe, listing five points to consider that Gabe will be the most powerful character in the game, that he'll also transform into his current in-real-life bearded form comparable to a Super Saiyan, that Barney would let Gabe use his own likeness in Gabe's games, that his friend would put Gabe's favorite animal in Crossy Road, and a final point simply saying, please. The email must have gotten someone's attention at Valve, because a representative replied expressing that Gabe had given his blessing to move forward with the character. Now if the player sets their name to HL3, Gabe will appear as a monster in-game. Did you know? Minecraft was partly inspired by an earlier game created by Marcus Notch Person called Ruby Dunk. Although not much is known about Ruby Dunk, it was planned to be more of a base building type game like Dwarf Fortress. Ruby Dunk's grass and cobblestone textures were actually used later in Minecraft, and early versions of Minecraft were named Ruby Dunk internally. Notch had the idea of adding a first person view to Ruby Dunk, but he decided the textures appeared a little bit too low resolution and distorted in first person view and scrapped the idea. Notch later stumbled upon another indie game called 
Infini Miner. He thought Infini Miner's building mechanics were fun, but that they lacked variety. This inspired Notch to create a first person fantasy game using old terrain assets from Ruby Dung. Some aspects of this new game were also inspired by the PC god game Dungeon Keeper, a game where you build things and explore dungeons. Notch reused a blocky human character model from one of his earlier projects called Zombie Town, which was also the source of Minecraft mobs. At the time, Notch hadn't decided on a name for Minecraft and simply referred to it as Cave Game. The game's first official name was Minecraft Order of the Stone, which was a reference to a webcomic called Order of the Stick. The game's name was shortened to just Minecraft to appear simpler and prevent people from confusing it with the Order of the Stick webcomic. After the basic mechanics of Minecraft were set in place, Notch began work on the game's multiplayer mode and experimented with several other ideas. One idea Notch had was to populate the world with animals. While making a model for a pig, he accidentally mixed up the X and the Y axis on the pig's body, making it stand vertically. This model is actually what Minecraft's creeper enemies are based on today. All of the game's living creatures, including the humans, were also originally intended to be gender neutral. This is why cows have both horns and udders, and chickens have rooster wattles despite laying eggs. Notch also intended to include a sky dimension, which would be the polar opposite of the nether. In a live webcast with FIBA.SE, Notch revealed the sky dimension would probably be a dream world, and that there would be a chance you could teleport there randomly while sleeping in a bed. The player would later learn how to trigger this event purposely. However, Notch delayed this new area until he could make the nether more interesting. Eventually, the sky dimension was converted into the end, which is a grim, empty place floating in a void. The connection can be seen in the end biome ID, which says sky. This was likely overlooked by the developers and left in the game. Minecraft's been updated over the years with new features, but easter eggs and secrets were also snuck in as well. When you enchant an item in the game, the strange symbol that describes the type of enchantment you're using is actually a direct usage of the standard galactic alphabet from the Commander Keen series. In October 2011, Notch posted an image on Twitter of Minecraft's enchantment screen. The image contained a few hidden messages in the standard galactic alphabet. The first enchantment translated as, well played internet, you are good. The second translated as, these names will be random and confusing. Confusing. And finally, the third translated as each spell costs experience levels, which secretly described a function of the enchantment table. When the enchantment table was added to the game, more references were included. One of these enchantments translates as the Elder Scrolls, likely a joke aimed at Bethesda, creator of the Elder Scrolls series, and whose parent company Zenimax attempted to sue Mojang for their name of the upcoming game Scrolls. The enchantment that says Klaatu Beretta Nikto is a misspelled reference to Klaatu Barada Nikto. The phrase originates from the 1951's The Day the Earth Stood Still. There's also an enchantment that says Zizzy, which is a magic spell from an old 1970s adventure game called Colossal Cave Adventure. Even Minecraft's title screen has hidden secrets. The text below the main title is changed randomly and sometimes references pop culture. But if you go into your Minecraft files and delete splash.txt without deleting the meta inf folder, the splash text on the title screen will say, Missing No. This is a reference to the infamous glitch Pokemon from Pokemon Red and Blue. There's also a chance that the main title itself will say Mintraft instead of Minecraft. You can also create decorative paintings in the game, many of which hold references to other video games. The paintings named Aztec, Aztec 2 and Bomb are all pixelated representations of Counter-Strike maps. There's also a painting called Graham that shows King Graham from the point and click adventure game series King's Quest. Graham appears again in a painting called Stage, despite the background being a direct reference to Space Quest and not King's Quest. An image of two men fighting, named Fighters, pays homage to the 1980s fighting game International Karate Plus. Another painting, titled Pointer, pays homage to the original International Karate. There's also a fairly noticeable homage to Donkey Kong and a painting called Skeleton, which references the meme midget from the adventure game Grim Fandango. It's well known that the Enderman are a reference to the Slenderman monster, but they also have another secret. The Enderman's voices seem to be distorted and reversed audio clips of someone talking. It's thought that the Enderman is saying, here, yeah. hiya, yeah. what's up, or this way, <laughs> forever, and uh-oh. <laughs> You can also name mob creatures in the game. If you name a mob creature Dinnerbone or Grum, the creature will flip upside down. This is an easter egg put into the game by the developers and references two staff members at Mojang, Nathan Dinnerbone Adams and Eric Grum Bros.
Did you know? The Victor Rydberg School in Stockholm, Sweden featured Minecraft in a mandatory class. Sweden hosts a national school competition called Future City. The competition invites classes from all around the nation to submit proposals on how to make Sweden a better place to live. The school turned this concept into a giant 180 student class designed to teach the basics of sustainable city planning. This includes survival essentials such as electricity grids using redstone and the various blocks which interact with it, along with food and water supply networks. According to the teachers there, the class was a great success. Despite some initial doubt, both parents and students found it to be an enjoyable departure from traditional teaching methods. In similar fashion, the United Nations Human Settlement Program, UN Habitat, is using Minecraft to teach young people how to plan urban spaces. The goal of the organization is to create or improve 300 spaces in various parts of the developing world by 2016, such as Haiti, Nepal, India, Rwanda, and Kenya. This project, dubbed Block by Block, has already turned out results in several locations all around the world, and more maps are being developed constantly. Minecraft's plethora of practical applications are taken advantage of by numerous organizations, one of which is People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, or PETA. In late 2014, PETA hosted its own Minecraft server featuring a recreation of their headquarters and a purposefully abandoned circus and slaughterhouse. And of course, it was impossible to harm any animals of any kind on the server. According to Director of Marketing Innovation Joel Bartlett, PETA has heard from many of our supporters who love Minecraft as much as they care about good treatment of animals. They said they would like to have an animal-friendly server inside their favorite world. An infographic created by NeoMam Studios and Mining Examiner shows that diamonds are potentially 11 times rarer in Minecraft than they are in the real world. Diamonds take up somewhere between 0.02% and 0.18% of the Earth's crust, whereas they comprise a 0.016% of any regularly generated Minecraft world. The only ore that's rarer in Minecraft is emerald. Diamonds were originally going to be called emeralds, but were renamed due to their light blue color. Up until Minecraft 1.3, the game's code even referred to diamonds as emeralds. But since emeralds were introduced in 1.3, they finally made the change. Emeralds themselves were originally rubies. The rubies were changed because developer Nathan Dinnerbone Adams is colorblind and couldn't easily tell the difference between the ruby ore and the redstone ore. Minecraft developers Mojang are no strangers to messing with their own community. For years, Reddit user Jesse Mofo Rice had their profile file name as Mojang Sucks Dick after failing to resolve a login issue. In May 2015, Mojang noticed the name and changed the player's name to No We Don't without them knowing. According to Mark Watson, a support agent at Mojang, I was actually looking for a username with the words Percentage Sucks Dick due to an unrelated report of harassment. Usually we let servers handle all the moderation, but it was a parent and a kid and well, I was just covering some bases. I never did find the username they reported. They couldn't remember the exact spell but I did find this gem. As of this video, Minecraft features two kinds of golems, iron and snow golems. Both types are created by stacking iron or snow in a specific shape, then placing a pumpkin or a jack-o'-lantern on top. The iron golem has a completely different look to that of the snow golem and ditches the jack-o'-lantern face. But as it turns out, the jack-o'-lantern is not the snow golem's actual face either. The jack-o'-lantern is considered a helmet and the simple smiley face beneath it can be seen through certain camera angles or spectator mode. Unlike the snow golems, which are more or less snowball throwing automatons, the iron golems are more like guardians, which patrol and reside within villages and have a fondness for villagers. The iron golems vine covered designs and tendencies to give flowers to the villagers they protect is a reference to the semi-sentient robots featured in the animated film Laputa Castle in the Sky. There is a 1 in 2500 chance that a hostile rabbit with white fur and red horizontal eyes will spawn in any normal Minecraft world. This rabbit is a reference to a rabbit from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. In the film, the rabbit, which was built up to be some kind of monstrous beast of great power, appears completely innocent and harmless. However, when the knights approach it, it goes ballistic and begins to attack everyone in sight. Plenty of new mobs and animals have been added to Minecraft since it officially launched, but a small handful were cut and can only be spawned with the special console command. A giant zombie, referred to simply as Giant, was implemented back on December 22, 2009, but their ability to spawn was removed the following day. The two types of horse included the skeleton horse and a zombie horse. They do, however, have sound effects attached to them as well as specific drops. Even if spawned using the special command, they cannot be set or tamed unless they were spawned as such. 
Lastly, a special mob combination called the Wither Jockey exists, but will never occur naturally. A spider has a 1% chance to spawn a skeleton rider, and since 80% of skeletons spawned in the nether are wither skeletons, there's a 0.8% chance of a Wither Jockey combo spawning. The only problem is, spiders have a 0% chance of spawning in nether naturally, but it can't be done using creature eggs. There are over 350 splash screen messages in Minecraft as of right now, and most of them are references. Follow the train, CJ! Refers to a line set at the end of the mission, wrong side of the tracks, in Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. The mission is notorious and deceptively difficult, so hearing the line multiple times was common. Gargamel Plays It is a reference to the antagonist of the Smurf series named Gargamel. Jason? Jason! Jason! brings up a commonly criticized gameplay feature of Heavy Rain, wherein the main character yells his son's name repeatedly while trying to find him. Give Us Gordon is a reference to Give Us Gordon Freeman graffiti found in the Half-Life games, but it also could be interpreted as a demand for Half-Life 3. A series of these messages recommend other indie games, including V, Super Meat Boy, Terraria, Mountain Blade, Project Zomboid, World of Goo, Limbo, Pixel Junk Shooter, and Braid. Did you know? About a third of the levels in New Super Lucky's Tale are built in a 2D style, which is an idea carried over from a previous game in the series. The idea for these 2D levels comes from the original Lucky's Tale, which was an Oculus Rift exclusive. 2D levels were put in the game to give players a short break from Lucky's Tale's fully 3D levels, which might be overwhelming to some players using VR. Before Lucky's Tale, VR games were typically first-person, as this was assumed the best way to have an immersive VR environment. However, the developers at Playful Studios wanted to try their hand at a third-person game in the medium and based Lucky's Tale on a few prototypes they'd made. Platformers typically have appealing worlds that are easy to be immersed in, even on a flat TV screen, and Playful wanted to see how this would translate to a VR experience. They also wanted the game's character to recognize the player's presence and look at the player as they played, reacting to their movements. Lots of different characters were prototyped before the team decided on Lucky being a fox. While working on the original VR prototype, the team had a placeholder capsule character that run around the game world. This capsule was later changed to a humanoid so developers got a better sense of the character's movement. At one point, Playful even experimented with a three-eyed alien with overalls as the main character. They ultimately decided to base the character on an animal and explored several mammal-based designs including a raccoon, a squirrel, and a lemur. This was because the game was VR, and the team wanted the character to seem like a stuffed animal, as if a teddy bear had come to life. Even after deciding that Lucky would be a fox, the character had several major redesigns before his final iteration. Disney characters were a large inspiration for Lucky's design, as they have a timeless quality to them. Director Dan Hurd elaborated, telling Did You Know Gaming, We wanted Lucky to have a timeless design and appeal, and so we looked to characters that had that particular feel to them. Mickey and Mario were standout references for us for those reasons. When Playful got the chance to make Super Lucky's Tale on the Xbox One, the team saw it as an opportunity to bring the franchise to a new audience. They furthered this ambition when they set up a meeting with Nintendo. Heard told us, We approached Nintendo with an early playable version of Super Lucky's Tale running on the Switch, and they thought it was a great idea. From there, the team thought about what product we were passionate about launching on the Switch, and the completely reimagined new Super Lucky's Tale was born. Microsoft, who originally published the game on Xbox One and PC, were supportive of Playful's choice too, recognizing that a Switch release might bring new players into the market and heighten franchise awareness. While making the game, Playful looked at titles like Super Mario 64, Mario Galaxy, Crash Bandicoot, Klonoa, Rocket Knight, Sonic, Ratchet & Clank, and even obscure games like Jumping Flash for inspiration. The developers were also heavily inspired by games developed by Rare. Character interactions and dialogue in particular were based on interactions with characters in Rare games like Banjo-Kazooie. Lucky himself also takes some cues from other characters. For example, Lucky's kick attack was inspired by the kick attack in Battletoads. Lucky's movements were also inspired by real-life foxes. The team wanted to emphasize the character's tail, so a swipe attack was added. Lucky's burrowing came about thanks to a video of a fox bounding up and down in the snow, as well as another video where a fox jumps on a trampoline. These examples were very smooth and flowy, and lined up with the direction Playful wanted for the character. Like all video games, several ideas for Lucky's tail didn't make the final game, including some abilities. 
Dan Hurd told us, there was a feature I would have liked to include called Fox Sense that would help Lucky find additional hidden treasures and secret paths. I'm hoping to revisit that idea someday. I also think there's tons of potential in the burrow and slide that we're excited to continue to explore. Several characters were cut or drastically changed as well. The developers even made a music video memorializing a character called Cucumber Man, who was just barely cut from the game. There's also some spiky fish the team called Fugu that can only be seen in the intro of the original release of Super Lucky's Tale. Regarding characters that were altered, the Wriggle enemy originally had a creepier design with a more human face. The Yeti characters that live in Restful Retreat were once holiday-obsessed displaced snow yetis rather than the peaceful wrestlers they are in the final game. The game had several unused ideas for kitty litter boss concepts, and the game's main antagonist, Jinx, was once a strange hairless cat in a robotic exoskeleton. The team also had unused ideas for an entire robot civilization, of which Chip, one of their guardians, is a part of. The developers at Playful lived up to their namesake by including a fair amount of easter eggs and references in the various versions of Super Lucky's Tale. The Xbox One and PC versions have several achievements that reference other pieces of media. The achievement Gotta Go Fast is a nod to Sonic the Hedgehog, the See Me Rollin' references the song by Chameleon Air, and the Fox and the Pound is a pun on Disney's The Fox and the Hound. Several easter eggs are spread throughout the game's Foxington area, including one easter egg that has a special significance for Playful. The arcade machine in the treehouse has the initials JPR under the high score. This was in honor of a Make-A-Wish recipient named Jimmy who visited Playful Studios. The machine and initials are there to commemorate that visit, and the fun Playful had helping Jimmy fulfill his wish. Another easter egg can be found in the treehouse in Foxington, where a tiny leafy sits on a shelf. This is from one of Playful's other titles, the sandbox survival game created Metaverse. There's also a tiny water well in this area, which represents an epic clash director Dan Hurd and art director Matt Burke had over the original Lucky's Tale. Hurd decided to take the well out of Lucky's Tale because it didn't follow the team's goal that every prop in a level must have an interactive element to it. Since then, Burke and the rest of the art team have delighted in putting the well wherever they can get away with. Did you know? Although Among Us's factions are crewmates and imposters, this wasn't always the case. The imposter role originally had a different name, and was called the Infected, a nod to the imposters actually being parasitic shape-shifting aliens. Speaking of imposters, the developers at Inner Sloth have confirmed that there was another early kill animation planned that never made it into the game. So early, in fact, that it never even reached the animation stage. The idea was for the imposter to pull out a wire or a string and strangle their crewmate victim to death. Unsurprisingly, this idea wasn't included as the team considered it to be too gruesome for the cutesy slapstick aesthetic they were aiming for. This kill animation was also likely a nod to the Hitman franchise, and Agent 47's signature choice of dispatching a target. Among Us was only in development for six months before gamers were able to play it, and with helpful feedback from beta players, it only took Inner Sloth another six months to release the final game. Bizarrely, it took just as long for Among Us to be recognized. Over a full year passed before the game was able to find the huge mainstream audience it has today. Many attribute the game's delayed success to the increase in people staying home during the coronavirus pandemic. While this sudden wave of success was far from unwelcome, the team took the initiative to cancel the sequel they were planning, Among Us 2, to focus on their new player base. Inner Sloth decided that instead of a sequel, they'd try to incorporate their ideas for the next game into the first Among Us through updates, including an account system for players, as well as an increase in maximum players above the current limit of 10. Some of these ideas were considered for the first game originally, but were dropped during development for one reason or another. The design for the crewmate was decided on almost immediately immediately, with only a few quick concepts drawn shortly beforehand. Alternative designs included simply removing the crewmate's backpack, a similar appearance to that of the mini crewmate pet, and another that seems to present itself in more of a star pose. To find out more about Among Us development, Did You Know Gaming spoke with Inner Sloth's Marcus Bromander, better known as Puffballs United. We asked Puff about his inspirations for the game's distinctive art style, and he told Did You Know Gaming, I started out making games on Newgrounds using Flash back in 2008. I've stuck with Flash 
flash since then, so I've kind of just developed and refined that simplistic flash art style. I'm glad people like the simplistic art style, because I always just see it as a limitation of my ability. Seeing as the game might have a fair amount of unused content, we asked Puff if any tasks had been left out of the game for whatever reason. To our surprise, he explained that the game originally functioned fairly differently. Rather than players doing tasks to fill a task bar like in the final release, the original concept was for tasks to replenish a sort of HP bar. One of the tasks planned during this early state was a kind of Guitar Hero-esque task that would have reduced the crew's bar for every note that was missed, but fill it with every note that was hit successfully. The team decided to shift the game's direction, however, as they felt it was a more interesting experience when each player was given specific tasks, instead of simply wandering the ship trying to fix things at random. The rhythm-based task didn't survive the transition, though in Puff's own words, maybe one day? In total, there are 12 different color choices for the player's crewmate, but just like the tasks, these have also been adjusted over time. There was originally a tan color, but because it was too similar to brown, and even orange and white, it would have caused problems for colorblind players. And since players keep track of each other by remembering everyone's color, this would cause a lot of confusion, especially during the game's discussion phases. Accessibility was actually an important part of development that had been slightly overlooked during early stages, but the team became more aware as their player count increased, and more updates were made to help improve the game's accessibility for colorblind players, such as adding symbols to the wire matching task. There's actually another color of crewmate that's remained in the game, but it can't be selected by players. While there are two shades of green crewmates, green and lime, there's also a third known as Fort Green. This player color can only be seen when they're connecting to a game, with the player's name set to three question marks and changing as soon as a stable connection is made. The name of this color, Fort Green, is likely a reference to one of the game's developers, who uses the handle Fort Base. Interestingly, Puff told us that the least popular colors, according to player statistics, are actually green, lime, and brown, with the most popular player choices for colors being red, black, and white. This isn't the only reference snuck in the game. In fact, there's actually quite a few of them. A substantial number of references are made to Henry Stickman, a series of games created by Puffballs United. There are a great many references to the series, including pets, items and tasks, and even the series protagonist as a hat. These aren't the only easter eggs. On the Vital Signs machine, the logo of a brand called Simsong can be seen, which is a combined reference to both Samsung and The Simpsons. One secret that takes more effort to discover can be found during the boarding pass scanning task. If players actually scan the QR code on screen, they'll see the message, Yo home, smell you later, which is likely a reference to the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. But this is the game's most obscure secret. Among Us has one secret that can't even be seen in-game. The file name for the skull object in the store artifacts task is actually named panel specimen undertale sands.png. Another nod can be found during the water plants task where the text watering can get will appear. This is a nod to the GameCube classic Super Mario Sunshine. The Japanese version of Sunshine displays the message shine get when Mario collects a shine sprite. This task also seems to reference the Zelda series with the third plant from the left strongly resembling a Korok. The Polis map also has a number of references in its tasks and animations. One reference can be seen when voting off a player suspected of being an imposter. Rather than launching the player into space, they are dropped into a pool of lava. Before sinking to their death, there's a chance that the crewmate will throw a thumbs up. This is a reference to the iconic scene in Terminator 2 Judgment Day, where the T-800 played by Arnold Schwarzenegger gives a thumbs up while being lowered into molten metal. There's also a hidden crewmate in the laboratory's toilets. It's barely noticeable during normal play, as it's obscured by the stall's door. Another movie reference is the map itself. Being a science base found on an Arctic planet, the map parallels the Arctic Research Facility, which is the setting for John Carpenter's 1982 movie The Thing. Both The Thing and Among Us follow a team trying to discern which of their fellow crew have become infected with a shape-shifting alien of some kind that's trying to take out the rest of the party. Another interesting tidbit about Polis is that the map originally had one reactor sabotage instead of two, and was called a weather sabotage. Sabotage. The map also had a small area in the bottom left below weapons. When speaking with Puff, we asked about why the team chose to go with a sci-fi setting. He told us that it seemed like a natural fit, considering a shape-shifting being can
can imitate other players, and having the game set in space enhances the feeling of isolation. We also asked Puff how he felt about the game's sudden popularity, considering the gap between peak player base and release, and whether he felt that the COVID-19 pandemic played a part in its sudden resurgence. He said, We're blown away and slightly overwhelmed by the insane amount the game took off. We're so grateful to everyone who enjoys the game, and it's very exciting to release new content for a game so many people are excited about. I think COVID did play a part in the game taking off this year. It's an easy way to connect with family and friends through the internet, which is something a lot of people needed during quarantine. Interestingly, Among Us has been balanced in such a way that statistically, imposters have won matches 58% of the time as of the end of 2020, primarily by dispatching the rest of the crew through kills, rather than sabotage. Hello and welcome to Did You Know Gaming Extra. In this episode, we'll be exploring trivia relating to some of the many Flash games that have released over the years, and their resulting commercial video games. It isn't any surprise to hear that the origin for a number of popular games released for home consoles over the years was in Flash, being an easy-to-approach coding language with a lot of flexibility in what it can deliver. With Flash being phased out as a standard web format due to Apple's lack of support since 2010, Chrome dropping it in December of 2020, and with its owners Adobe dropping its support, perhaps now is the best time to look at several games that made the most out of the platform, and of course, the places that were portals for these games, such as Newgrounds. Newgrounds, one of the most popular online Flash portals ever, would eventually become the foundation of a new game development studio called The Behemoth. Their first commercial game was Alien Hominid, a somewhat standard run-and-gun platformer utilizing a very Flash style of vector artwork that made it stand out from the crowd. The game was never intended to be a full production console game, and was only made as a hobbyist work attempting to recreate Metal Slug and Contra-style gameplay mechanics within Flash. Tom Fulp and Dan Paladin enjoyed creating new concepts that pushed Flash beyond what many assumed it was capable of. This cool tech demo was just their way of inspiring others who worked with Flash, and showing them what's capable within the action script coding language. It was soon evident that the game should have been bigger than just a demo, so work was done to bolster the title. This included testing out a variety of features, such as introducing shading to the 2D artwork, as well as realistic and cel-shaded 3D art. The team didn't think these really provided as much personality as the relatively simple hand-drawn animations seen in the Flash demo, nor did they think that the game would have been able to attain the kinetic energy they'd already demonstrated. At the time of Alien Hominid's console release, many drew connections between the titular Hominid and that of Disney's Stitch character. Fulp was fairly annoyed about this connection made by players, as he created the game's character well before any publicity of Stitch, with the original Flash file dating March 2002, three months before Lilo and Stitch's release. It's not surprising that Alien Hominid would lead the way for Flash games to become more mainstream. A huge wave of indie game developers now knew that they too could break into a more mainstream gaming audience. Though being released after Alien Hominid and even the Behemoth's castle crashes, the indie scene saw a huge invested interest from gamers after Team Meat's Super Meat Boy hit the scene. Not just because of its release for Xbox Live Arcade, but also due to its inclusion as a central topic within the popular indie game The Movie. The original version of Super Meat Boy was released on Newgrounds before a full game was even created. This version, now referred to as a prototype from which the full game was built upon, was put on the site with a mature rating, including mild nudity, mild violence, and adult themes. Seeing as the game was also published and promoted by Nintendo for their WiiWare service, IGN asked lead designer Edmund McMullen about Nintendo's view of the game's supposed mature themes. He said, There actually wasn't any of that other than mild violence in the Flash version of the game. I just lied in the submission form on Newgrounds because I thought more kids would play it if they thought they might see some boobies. I was right. When asked about why they seemed to be focusing heavily on the console market, and whether this was by choice, sound effects designer Jordan Fair claimed, I can't speak for Edmund, but as far as I understand it, Nintendo approached him about it and originally it was going to be one of his other Flash games that was going to be remade, and it ended up being Meat Boy in the end. So it pretty much all started with Nintendo. Although McMullen also released a demo on Newgrounds for his next game, The Binding of Isaac, this was actually after the game's official release. Whilst Isaac is mostly played in its Rebirth edition as it stands, the original version of the game was simply a Flash game sold through Steam. 
like other Flash games, it was never intended to become the success that it has, and was originally made for a game jam over the course of a single week. Tommy Rafines, who'd worked with Edmund on Super Meat Boy as lead programmer, was on vacation at the time, and so Florian Himsel was brought in, having previously worked with Edmund on earlier Flash titles. The main goals for the game were twofold. Firstly, to create a roguelike game following the Legend of Zelda dungeon structure, but also to explore Macmillan's relationship with religion. Your son has become corrupted by sin. He needs to be saved. After the week, it was clear that Isaac had a lot of potential, which they felt was simply too good to pass up. So the duo continued their work, with everything being coded using ActionScript 2 in Flash. They weren't really sure how they intended to sell the game at this stage. They weren't even sure if they were going to sell it, but they saw it was a big challenge that they'd like to see through to the end. The extent of the game's success certainly wasn't immediate, though it was never exactly struggling. During the first couple of weeks after it was published on Steam, the game averaged around 100 to 200 copies sold every day, eventually leveling out at 150 a day after a few months. While these figures broke Edmund's expectations, five months after release, he recalls something odd happening. Our daily average started to climb. 200 copies per day turned into 500 copies, then 1,000 copies, and by the seven-month mark, Isaac was averaging sales of more than 1,500 copies a day and climbing. I couldn't explain it. We hadn't put the game on sale or anything, so I was clueless as to why sales were continuing to grow. Then I checked out YouTube and I noticed that fans of the game were uploading Let's Play videos constantly, over 100 videos every day, each getting tons of traffic. Isaac had found its fan base, and that base was growing larger and larger. Not bad for a game that was meant to fail. But before Flash really hit it big, one humble game still holds strong in the hearts of many, Line Rider. The game was originally created by Bostjan Kardes, a Slovenian student who had posted the game to his DeviantArt page. However, it wasn't until user Unconed posted the game to Dig that it really hit a wide audience. Whilst considered a standard part of any game involving the creation of your own stages, Line Rider had intentionally foregone an eraser tool, with the idea being that it would make any final creation all the more impressive as it would have had to have been made without any mistakes. However, the game was later updated to introduce an eraser, the ability to zoom, and line variations. The game actually did see commercial success, with In Exile Entertainment buying the rights, thus preventing others from mimicking the concept. The company published a sequel in 2008 for Nintendo DS, Wii, and Windows, bringing in Tech Dog, a well-known track designer for the original game, and introducing a new story mode with voice acting supplied by Tom Kenny of SpongeBob fame, Tara Strong, and Fred Tattashaw. Now, here's an obscure Flash game that seemed to actually make some waves. Nanaka Crash. To some, this game will bring back vivid memories. To others, it might seem a strange choice for this video. The game simply involves hitting a character across a long distance, with different characters they can bump into to cause different effects, such as a boost or a slowdown. Firstly, many players may be unaware of the game's origins. It was really a fan game for Cross Channel, a then-Japanese exclusive visual novel, explaining the above-average artwork as it was all ripped from a real visual novel game. Secondly, the game wound up becoming so popular that it became an official part of the Cross Channel series. In 2014, Nanaka Crash was relaunched, changing several elements of the game, including its graphics and sound all officially endorsed by Flying Shine, Cross Channel's original developer. Not only was the Flash version updated, but the game was also published and made available on mobile formats, though these are seemingly no longer available. This is Tom Fulp, and if you've heard that name before, you've probably spent a lot of time in the late 90s and 2000s on a website called Newgrounds.com. Created all the way back in 1995, Newgrounds was a site dedicated to hosting animations and games made using a little web-focused multimedia program called Flash. Lots of other sites would take inspiration from how Newgrounds functioned, but it's the site's content that truly shaped the internet. Newgrounds launched with the slogan, The Problems of the Future Today, a jab at the mundane phrase, The Generation of Tomorrow. But the site's motto would change in 2006 to Everything by Everyone, a slogan Tom thought better encapsulated what Newgrounds was all about. 
The site continues to push this point home, welcoming everyone to share their original animations, games, art, and music all across the site. Newgrounds thrives on its community, encouraging people to meet and collaborate on projects of any size. In order to make this video, we reached out to several creators from the platform, including Tom himself, to present a more intimate history of the site, the games that it spawned, and the relationships it helped flourish, and how it impacted the gaming industry. And while he may be Newgrounds' chief architect, Tom has published his own fair share of creations to the site. Most notably and recently repopularized original character Pico, a sexually ambiguous ginger lad rocking some semi-automatics and a green shirt. The large vacant white eyes of Pico and Tom's other characters were directly inspired by Little Orphan Annie comics. Why was Tom such a fan of Little Orphan Annie comics? I have no idea. <laughs> Other influences on Tom's characters came from South Park and a desire to make parodies of cute edutainment games. Tom's first take on the idea was with the game Pico's School, which follows an ordinary day at school until without warning a group of goth kids led by a group of aliens known as the Penalians start a shootout. Pico is now tasked with defending the school and stomping out the ensuing chaos. Newgrounders loved the game, but there were many who felt it was made in poor taste, as it released only a few months after the tragic Columbine High School Massacre. A number of people connected with Pico and the anxiety he experiences throughout, but others were not particularly fans of the vulgar themes and satire paired with such a grim event. But Tom just wanted to make something unique and outlandish, and had no intention of social commentary on the tragedy. Even with the meek controversy swirling around, Pico's school set the foundation for Tom's vision with Newgrounds. While Pico's school could easily offend, it also had a very comical and absurd amount of cartoon violence that gave it a substantial disconnect from reality. There aren't many games where players have literal shit thrown at them, and the final boss waves his dick around until you blast it off with a torrent of dick blood raining down all over the damn place, until you somehow return to school with your mental health completely intact, despite this unspeakably fucked up event. Okay. After Pico's School launched in 1999, Tom was quick to begin work on Pico's School 2 and would restart development after Mind Chamber joined Tom as the artist for the project. While a few design tests were done with other artists, Tom fell in love with Mind Chamber's rendition of Pico, which captured his fun spirit and innocence best of all. A good deal of work went into the project and it was looking to be another impressive Flash games in Tom's repertoire of achievements. Unfortunately, after thoughtful consideration, the scope of the project was deemed too ambitious, and Pico School 2 was put on indefinite hold. The story of the sequel originally continued right after the end of the first game, with the Penalians sending in replacements for the goth kids in the form of ghetto bots. Now city-sized in scope rather than just Pico's school being at risk, the dick aliens were steadfast in striking fear into the general public and destroying society to prepare Earth for totalitarian rule. All was not lost, however. Tom would continue to watch over this site and work on other projects, one of which was Alien Hominid, a collaboration with artist Dan Paladin. Alien Hominid is a run-and-gun style title that follows the titular character crashing down to Earth rather unluckily right in front of FBI headquarters. An organization in this universe who don't particularly like aliens and would rather shoot first and ask questions later. While the game was fairly short, the cartoonish violence and antics that Newgrounds content was famous for quickly became another hit among its users. For years leading up to this, Tom would spend his days dreaming of making a legit console game but while hopeful, he wasn't sure they'd ever come to fruition. Nevertheless, he'd continue dreaming. Tom would compose 20-page game design documents, occasionally mailing them out to his favorite game companies like SNK, hoping his pitch would be greenlit into being made. However, Flash was his real gateway into the big leagues, and he'd make his start by co-founding his own game development studio, The Behemoth, in 2003. This company was on the cusp of making history for all the indie web developers out there as they were on the verge of bringing their breakout web hit Alien Hominid to consoles. Tom's dream was finally realized in 2004 when Alien Hominid saw a full console release in the US and UK on the GameCube, PS2, and Xbox. The title even got a Game Boy Advance port in 2006. This retail version of the game was much more ambitious than the original Flash title. 
New features, mini games, overhauled visuals, and a two player mode were all added. What started out as a humble Flash game would turn out to be one of the biggest steps forward for the indie scene, being a huge source of inspiration for all within it. After the game's success, Tom purchased an office in the Philadelphia suburbs dubbed, surprisingly, the Newgrounds Office, that would grow to become a hub for artists and devs from the site. Asked for a few words for aspiring developers, Tom had this to say. For developers starting out, I would say not to shy away from making silly joke games or joining in game jams. Whatever gives you motivation to complete a small task and learn something along the way. For developers who've been at it for a while, I'd say persistence is important because you never know when you'll capture lightning in a bottle. Also, if you're an up and coming dev, don't hesitate to reach out to up and coming artists and musicians you like. Today's talented nobodies will be tomorrow's successful in crowd. As Newgrounds grew up, it would adopt a new tank-inspired logo in 2000, designed by Andrew Brosnia. A few years later, it would be reworked by Jeff Bandolin. Hey, that's me! For the site's redesign in 2006. The tank redesign went through a few wildly different iterations, but eventually stuck with a more refined version of the original. A few months after the new logo was introduced, I said, hey, Tom, I quit. And Tom said, shut up, Jeff, just go make a funny cartoon. And then we briefly gazed into each other's eyes, smiled mostly platonically, and I was off to the races trying to make an animation that wouldn't embarrass the company. Anyways, this was the beginning of a delightful military-inspired logo growing into a full-blown child-friendly mascot. The Tankman series is almost entirely about awkward relationships and dynamics between soldiers in an apocalyptic wasteland, but there are dick jokes too. The two main characters, Captain and Steve, Hell, almost every character are based on my own exaggerated personality traits because I'm actually a terrible actor, so this is how it had to be. Captain is more cartoonishly arrogant and hard-edged, while Steve is younger and more naive. I found it relatively easy to write scripts essentially arguing with myself because I am a sociopath. The shorts were a hit with users and Tankmen helped grow an even stronger identity for Newgrounds and its brand of humor. Anything made with Flash was notorious for its low file sizes, making files very easy to pass between person to person for collaborative projects, no matter the distance between those involved. Unfortunately, the Flash Player, a browser plugin which Newgrounds was pretty much founded on, was discontinued by Adobe at the end of 2020. Nevertheless, Newgrounds would pivot and make the best of the situation with the release of a fully featured video player, other browser-based game support, and Ruffle, a Flash emulator to run and preserve all the Flash content made throughout the years. While Flash was initially built for easy creation of a host of web multimedia, it has been kept alive by passionate independent and studio animators alike. So Adobe rebranded it as Adobe Animate with a sharper focus on animation. Even with older Adobe Flash software not being actively supported by Adobe anymore, Several users across the site still use it for animation within their projects due to the fact that it still just works. A personal example is Nightmare Cops, an up-and-coming console and PC game by Newgrounds collaborators Tom Fulp, myself, and Spazkid, with the group primarily animating all the characters and assets with Flash. Another Newgrounds title with art created in Flash that became very popular recently is Friday Night Funkin'. A rhythm game put together for the 47th game jam hosted on Ludum Dare. The theme of this particular game jam was Stuck in a Loop, which inspired Friday Night Funkin' developer Ninja Muffin 99 and artist Phantom Arcade to make a rhythm game where characters sing or rap battle back and forth in a similar vein to Parappa the Rapper. To round out the team, they reached out to Kawhi Sprite as the game's composer, alongside Evil Skater as an additional artist for the weekend project. In a touch of irony, the title didn't even perform that well in the jam, barely reaching the top 10th percentile of the other contestants. The game gained quite a strong cult following on TikTok and Twitter. Those TikToks are legitimately scary. I am serious. The team was already planning to continue development after the jam was finalized, and the public's perception gave them a huge gust of motivation. And their work paid off as Friday Night Funkin' is now seen as a title that breathed some new life into Newgrounds. The style of the game's songs were initially based on Parappa, but the inspiration for the voices came from another PS1 game called Vib Ribbon. The concept of characters posing in whatever directions pressed by a player are from an earlier game Phantom created on Newgrounds called Get Creamed. Eventually, the artist for Get Creamed, Maling, 
would work alongside Phantom again for week six. The design process for the cast of characters in Friday Night Funkin' usually started with an initial sketch by Phantom, then with a stylized interpretation by Evil Skater, and then a final pass again by Phantom finding a happy medium between the two designs. Inspiration for Girlfriend's design came from Rhythm Heaven on the DS, specifically a girl wearing a similar red dress and shoes. Originally, the speakers Girlfriend sits on were meant to be a podium, serving to present Girlfriend as a prize to the player. Scandalous! However, many fans of the original Ludum Dare build interpreted the brown boxes as speakers and fan art and messages, which the team thought was a better concept, so they stole that idea and went with that instead. The skeleton of Girlfriend is also based on the x-rays Body Snatchers would display in Metal Gear Solid 5. Boyfriend's inspiration loosely stems from early Cartoon Network shows like Dexter's Laboratory and the Powerpuff Girls. Daddy Dearest's character is more of a comical take on dating experiences Phantom Arcade had gone through. Other members of the Newgrounds office, possibly me, even joked that Phantom's current girlfriend's dad will end up beating his ass and he'd need to prepare to defend himself when the day comes. I said that. True story. Week 1 of the game was originally supposed to push this idea further, where Daddy Dearest was meant to grow more and more hostile towards the boyfriend, attacking him with karate kicks. The player would have been able to dodge these attacks through the help of visual cues and retaliate by throwing their microphone back in Daddy Dearest's face. Interestingly, Pico was originally only meant to be a selectable character skin and not have a week all to his own. But things changed when the team needed a foil to make more time for Mommy Mirist's character development. The location used for Pico is based on the exterior roof of the Newgrounds office. The song Pico also samples another song called Endless Handbag, the main theme used for Newgrounds back in 1998. Newgrounds has had many other successes over the years. Starting off as an animation series on the site, Madness Combat grew a massive audience across Newgrounds, even having its own day celebrated site-wide. The series is based on an unnamed man who would later be coined Hank, who sets out to take down an agency who wants him dead. The agency succeeds several times in killing him, but Hank is continuously revived and resumes his violent efforts. When asked if he ever saw Madness reaching the popularity it has today, Crinkles told us, Oh man, absolutely not. I got into this to participate. When I was first finding Newgrounds, it was way back before the portable was automated. So we were just watching Tom hack and back out his homebrew stuff and loving it. The humor was just the back of the classroom nonsense, but to have it on the internet at the time was such an experience. I was just glad to be feeding stuff back to the system that inspired me to start in the first place. To have it explode my face is still to this day difficult to fathom. Fun fact, the iconic crosses seen on characters' faces in Madness are derived from general drawing guides of human faces. They serve as markers to help artists with facial direction and the space between features. Crinkles would fill his high school notes and sketchbook with these blobby characters and eventually stopped erasing the guidelines. This added so much uniqueness that Crinkles could just not simply draw the rest of the face. Delve into the medium still today, the Madness Flash games have potentially become even more recognizable. In 2003, Crinkles was approached by coder Max Abernathy about making a Madness video game, giving birth to Madness Interactive. The title became an instant hit on the site and both Max and Crinkles were blown away by the project's reception. The Madness franchise would continue to develop its story and characters further throughout its animations. While Crinkles was just starting to dip his toes in game development, games already had a strong influence on his work. The original XCOM on MS-DOS had a power armor set with asymmetrical optics, and similar looking headwear can be seen worn by members of the Agency Against Hank Wimbledon, specifically the Soldat and Engineer units. Crinkles would go on to work alongside another coder, Michael Swain, on Madness Project Nexus, nearly a decade after Interactive. Just as the quality of the animations was increasing with time, Crinkles pushed to keep the same standard with this new project. Madness Project Nexus ended up blowing Madness Interactive out of the water and became one of the most impressive projects on the site. The game would eventually be renamed to Madness Project Nexus Classic, 
as Crinkles and Swain would pivot to push madness even further and bring the franchise into a 3D space under the same name. Super Smash Flash is another noteworthy Newgrounds game and one of only three Super Smash Bros. fan projects to have its own dedicated Wikipedia page. But this project wasn't always intended to be a Smash Bros. project. It was originally started as a Sonic fan game. Alongside being a user on Newgrounds, the game's creator Cloud9 also ran his own community, the McLeod Gaming Forums. These forums didn't have the largest spriting community, but a user by the name of TopCat13 had some of the best sprite work on the site. Cloud liked his sprites so much that he asked TopCat if he could use his work for the Sonic project, specifically a Sonic OC by the name of Blade the Hedgehog. In early demos for the game, Blade was the single playable character. It would turn out later down the road that Blade wasn't solely original and bore a striking resemblance to another Sonic OC named Flare the Hedgehog from an animation series on Newgrounds called Knuckles Adventure. Eventually, the Sonic project by Cloud was dropped, and at the same time, the math for that sort of project was just a bit much. The project shifted over to the Smash fan project known today, and another character designed by Top Cat, Blue, joined the roster of playable fighters. The next character to join the roster was, almost unthinkably, Mr. Incredible from The Incredibles. Cloud told us about this choice, saying, I was just a big fan of the Incredibles movie, and there happened to be a decent sprite sheet on the Spriter's resource from a Game Boy Advance game, so I added them to my project. Cloud went on to push his coding abilities even further after the project's release, making a sequel aptly titled Super Smash Flash 2 in the puzzle game Yeah Jam Fury. There's also a new indie crossover game called Framemakers, where the tank man makes a cameo as one of the handful of assists. Cloud is broken into full-fledged game development, but will never forget his roots, telling us, there's something about the creative freedom in the Newgrounds community that always made it an extremely inviting place for new artists and game devs such as myself when I first joined. And I think that's the main driver in how Newgrounds has stood the test of time. No other single community based around animation and games has had such a huge influx of creative work uploaded on a daily basis and it plays a huge role in inspiring me to create and collaborate with others. Puffballs United may be better known for Among Us nowadays, but he originally got his start with the Henry Stickman series on Newgrounds, a popular choose-your-own-adventure style game. What might have not stuck with most players at first is the game is called Henry Stickman, not Stickman. Puffballs decided on the unique spelling mainly because Stickman comes off as boring and generic, and Stickman leaves a better impact. The name Henry has an even deeper history, being a name Puffballs used a lot throughout his work, being very common in RGP Maker projects he made when he was younger. Henry Stickman became well known for its large amount of pop culture references, ranging from Dragon Ball Z, Ace Attorney, Metroid, and more. However, Puffball's favorite reference he was able to implement was the JoJo scene in completing a mission. Puffball spent a lot of time on trying to make it feel as authentic as possible, as he is a big fan of the show and wanted to do it justice. Puffballs is another developer that got their small start on Newgrounds, and now they've made a game that has literally been played by over half a billion people with Among Us. One of the most notable faces from Newgrounds is Edmund McMillan, creator of Meat Boy and Binding of Isaac. Meat Boy actually started as a prototype platformer that focused on vertical levels rather than horizontal, called Vertigo, coded by Jonathan McGinty. For tackling art assets, Edmund used a red cube as a placeholder, but the simple cube started to grow on him, so he decided to use it as a base. Edmund originally wanted to revisit a concept of a character called the Meat Ninja, and the first design was a cubed human being turned inside out. This inside out body had a skeleton on the outside and wore an additional black hood. Over time, the design was simplified to help with readability, resulting in the character Meat Boy in the original Flash version of the game. Meat Boy would go on to be one of the most defining games for Newgrounds over time, and would be followed up with a sequel developed by the newly founded Team Meat under the name Super Meat Boy, released across digital services on console and PC. Edmund's main inspiration for the Meat Boy series has always been the Mario franchise, and he was even starting to reach a similar level of prestige to the plumber. The shortened acronym for Super Meat Boy is even a slight nod, literally SMB just like Super Mario Brothers. Seeing a console release, Meat Boy's design would be adjusted yet again to help with the cutscene animation and to be even more welcoming to a wider audience. 
The skeleton on the outside of Meat Boy was removed, with the character being presented more as a piece of meat this time around rather than being a kid without skin. Super Meat Boy was a roaring success, known for its difficult yet approachable level design. It became so popular, in fact, that PETA made its own parody in the same style as the original Flash game called Super Tofu Boy. Tofu Boy's mission was to stop the evil Meat Boy from his bloody rage in an attempt to save Bandage Girl from his clutches. Team Meat stayed quiet and gave no response to PETA's attempt to attack the IP. Instead, they went on to release Tofu Boy as an unlockable character in Super Meat Boy by entering the code PETA file on the character select screen. Tofu Boy is by far the worst playable character out of the cast having the lowest speed and jumping height due to his major iron deficiency. McMillan told us, I had officially made it. I was noticed by a huge company that gets easily offended. PETA went out of their way to pay someone to make a parody game off my game and characters. Edmund would eventually leave Team Meat to continue pursuing personal projects, opening the doors for Binding of Isaac, another title that has a history with Newgrounds. Isaac's history goes back to when Edmund was interested in pursuing a career in children's books, with Isaac's and Mom's designs originating from a concept called Mom's Hungry. This was meant to follow the story of a kid's father going missing, and due to the situation, the kid's mother requests her son grab her a wild list of food to tame her appetite. As she finished, she'd end up spewing all the food right back out. Ugh. The story was very similar to that of a tale called The Fat Cat which was a favorite of Edmund's as a kid. The Binding of Isaac started off with a similarly designed kid from Mom's Hungry, a little naked boy with a tuft of hair named Little Samson, named after the same biblical character. Isaac would eventually take the place as the main character, and Samson would eventually make his return as a playable character in the Wrath of Lamb DLC. Much how like Meat Boy was inspired by the Mario franchise, The Binding of Isaac took a lot of influence from The Legend of Zelda, Isaac followed a similar naming convention, Dungeons, and Top Down Angle for its gameplay. The title aimed to take on an 8-bit style, but this was dropped due to issues of Flash processing the visuals too smoothly rather than pixel by pixel. A single visual has survived from this point in development, the original sprite for Isaac. The pixelated look would be revisited with a new refined 16-bit visual style in the release of The Binding of Isaac Rebirth. The more obscure pieces of inspiration come from Edmund following Miyamoto's initial inspiration for the Zelda games, his childhood experiences. Zelda came around due to Miyamoto's love for exploration. Edmund's childhood, on the other hand, centered around a family that was split across two sides, with his father's side being heavily religious. Once every so many years, Edmund would visit them for Thanksgiving. The Macmillans had very strict rules, and this resulted in Edmund having his magic cards being taken away not being allowed to watch Ren and Stimpy, forbidden from playing any Zelda games. In short, anything with a slight connection to the devil was made out to be evil. Edmund, while showing strong distaste toward the events back then, decided to embrace his childhood to help impact the development of Isaac. This resulted in the story of Isaac's very religious mother taking away anything that can be seen as marginally sinful, like toys, video games, and even clothes from Isaac. Other inspirations come from old-school 80s Christian propaganda, Jack Chick being one of the largest influences. Jack Chick was a cartoonist known for his Chick Tracks, Christian propaganda comics, one of the most popular being Dark Dungeons, following a girl obsessed with the evil game Dungeons & Dragons, showing how it turns its players into cult members. How ironic. Major influences on Binding of Isaac's art style include Garbage Pail Kids, a gross-out parody based on Cabbage Patch Kids, alongside the Toxic Avenger. The Binding of Isaac would see a development time of around three months, with a demo released on Newgrounds, as that's where most of Edmund's following was. He simply told us, Without Newgrounds, I wouldn't have the legacy I have today. While all of these developers are great in their own right, and all have contributed to the world of video games and animation, Newgrounds wouldn't be where it is today without Tom Fulp. While making this video, he collected comments from all the developers involved who wanted to share their thanks and gratitude with Tom. And since we just talked about Edmund McMillan's history with Newgrounds, let's start with his words. 
Without Tom Fault, the Naughties wave of indies wouldn't have existed. Without his selfless love and support for artists from all walks of life, Flash games wouldn't have existed, and games in general would be far less innovative. Honestly, without Tom, Meat Boy, Isaac, and many other games simply wouldn't have ever existed, and I'd still be working part-time at GameStop. Friday Night Funkin's Ninja Muffin 99 left a message too, saying, I love Tom Fulp. I don't want to pick him up like a little baby, feed him a little hot, hot bottle of uh, evaporated milk, infant milk, and watch him grow up into a strong, powerful man. Greg McLeod, aka Cloud9, had this to say. I owe many thanks to Tom Fulp for founding the platform that enabled creators such as myself to find their spark, and inspired so much of the amazing content created on the web over the past couple decades. Whether it be independent animation, art, games, music, or all of the above, I truly believe Newgrounds fostered an entire generation of creative talent for which I'm grateful to have been a part of. I have a huge respect for Tom's ambition and proactiveness in adapting Newgrounds to the ever-changing landscape of the World Wide Web, and I look forward to seeing what's next. Puffballs United wanted to say, Thanks Tom. I wouldn't be where I'm at today without you, and I know I'm not the only one. The amount of personal passion you put into seeing other people's creativity is what makes the true heart of Newgrounds so great. Thank you for everything. Madness creator Crinkles exclaimed, Hey Tom, I want to thank you for creating Newgrounds. From the very first instant I saw that page, you can catch the subtle tagline of everything by everyone. Your passions were pushing you out into the arena of user-made content, and we were in awe, inspired. Like, hell, could we do this too? Before we knew it, you made the portal. And even before it was automated, it was a battle cry to squeeze artists out of the woodwork and start sharing on a global level that nobody had seen before. I'm glad to have been here to be a part of it, my dude. And Kawhi Sprint had this to say. I have to give eternal thanks to Tom Folt for everything that he's done for me in my career. If it weren't for Newgrounds, there would be so much art, music, and games that wouldn't be here. Thank you for supporting the underdogs like I used to be when there's so many other websites that seem so calculated cold and based on an algorithm. Newgrounds is like the opposite of that. It's curated and organic, and it's not based off of likes or anything like that. And I think that's punk rock. Tom Folt, a real homie. We even have some words from Tom Fulp himself, who leaves Did You Know Gaming with this final message. Newgrounds represents the promise of the internet, where anyone can make something and share it with the world. I think no matter how the internet changes and evolves, this will always be the best thing about it. Having seen so many sites come and go, I think it's important Newgrounds continues to keep its history alive while still making new history every day. Everyone is welcome to share their original animation, games, art, and music on Newgrounds. We love seeing cool original works, and we love it even more when people meet and team up to make things together. 